All right, hello everyone. My name is Kachun Yu, and I am an astronomer at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And today, um, as part of the science division, I'm going to be giving a short talk on um, what makes our planet and other planets potentially habitable in our solar system. And uh, for those of you who have um, questions, feel free to throw them in into the chat. And memory um, will um, help us um, help me um, pull those questions together, and uh, we'll be able to um, answer them um, later on uh, before the end of the half hour. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to um, start off. Um, I have some planetary visualization software from our friends um, at um, Digit um, Talus. And um, what we're going to do right now, we're at the Earth. But um, what we're going to do now is we're going to fly off and um, see if we can get um, to above the solar system. Here we go. And one of the first things. Um, we can talk about when um, talking about habitability of what makes planets habitable is how far they are from the sun. So let's, um, whoops, um, let's just look at the, uh, the planets um, in our um, solar system. And um, what we can see is we have Mercury um, closest to the sun and, um, and then follow that um, by Venus and Earth and then Mars. And, and bas basically Earth um, sits right in the middle of what we call the habitable zone. And so that's a place that's neither uh, too, neither too close nor too far from the sun. So it uh, neither gets too hot nor too cold. And it's um, also called the Goldilocks zone uh, because um, it's, um, it's just right, neither too hot nor too cold. And so um, one of the official definitions of, of a habitable zone is a, a region where uh, liquid water can exist on the surfaces of um, rocky or terrestrial planets. And so you can see that Mars um, is um, about 50% further um, from the sun and Venus is about 30% closer. And so they're right at the edges of the, uh, of the habitable zone. Although uh, it also turns out it's just not the distance, um, which uh, means the amount of light and heat um, the planets are getting from the sun, but um, it's also um, the atmospheres that, that has a role to play. So what we're gonna do is um, we're just gonna visit um, these three planets, um, Earth, um, well, Mars, Venus, and then Earth, and talk about um, what they're like today and what they might have been like in the past. So let's, um, we're going to jump to Mars. And so here is the planet Mars, and you can see it's a, um, you, know, well, you know, pretty dry um, desert-like world. Um, they're unlike the Earth. Um, we don't see any uh, blue of oceans or um, the bright white of water uh, vapor clouds, um, but we do see a pretty dusty um, desert-like landscape. And, uh, and the thing about Mars is that it's um, it, um, much colder than the Earth, and it's also a lot drier. So um, we um, don't obviously see any um, any evidence for bodies of water, but if we zoom in, what we'll, we will see, and let's um, so we can zoom in, we actually find evidence of what looks like um, places where water might have flowed. And so um, all over the surface of Mars, we um, find signs from our satellite, um, our spacecraft that are in orbit around Mars, that there, um, what, uh, there are what appears to be um, ancient river channels and deltas and even evidence, um, according to some planetary scientists, some Mars researchers, um, that there might have been um, oceans or um, large lakes um, and shorelines on Mars. And so we think that uh, many billions of years ago, Mars um, was much warmer. It had a much thicker atmosphere that allowed um, liquid water to exist and flow on the surface of Mars. And, um, and people have even imagined what that might've looked like. So here is um, an artist depiction from NASA of, um, of that Northern uh, Martian ocean, along with um, some lakes um, dotting the surface. But over time, uh, Mars lost um, its water. And the reason why we think that happened is that Mars, um, it, is too small of a planet. It's about half the size of the Earth. And so its gravity is weaker. It cooled off um, 
much um, earlier. Um, so um, it no longer has a magnetic field. And uh, the magnetic field um, on the Earth protects the Earth's atmosphere from um, cosmic rays and solar um, wind um, particles, which can smash into um, molecules in our atmosphere and, um, and sputter them or send them um, flying off into space. Mars's gravity um, was too weak to hold on to much of its atmosphere. And it also lost its water um, when ultraviolet radiation broke up the water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen, and the hydrogen just escaped into space. And so this is the reason why Mars, even though 95% of its atmosphere is carbon dioxide, um, which is a heat trapping gas, it's still um, an extremely cold um, place. All right, so with that, let's um, fly from Mars. We're gonna jump to our next planet, which is Venus. And Venus is um, a world that's um, about the same size as the Earth, but um, it, um, it's completely um, covered in, or in shroud, shrouded in clouds. And the atmosphere is about 90 times um, thicker than the Earth's atmosphere. And what that means, um, and because most of it is carbon dioxide, um, that carbon dioxide does trap um, the sun's light and heat um, underneath. And so the temperature on the surface is uh, much hotter than um, any temperatures that you can get in your oven at home. Um, it's over 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, um, and so um, Venus um, is the opposite of Mars, even though it's only 30% um, closer um, to the sun than the Earth, it's much, much hotter than the Earth. And uh, Venus um, has also lost uh, most of its water. Um, and uh, similar um, to Mars, Venus um, lost its water um, because of um, sun sunlight breaking apart um, water molecules and the hydrogen escaping. And even though uh, Venus has um, enough gravity to hold on to a strong atmosphere um, or a thick atmosphere, um, it was enough to hold on to its water. Now, an American spacecraft, the uh, Magellan spacecraft, um, did orbit uh, Mars, and it had a radar instrument that allowed it to peer through the clouds. And what it discovered is that the surface of Venus is um, shows signs of huge amounts of volcanic activity. Although um, there's uh, much debate about whether there are any volcanoes at all that are still active on Venus. We, um, many people think um, there aren't. But um, wherever we look on Venus, we see signs of uh, volcanic um, calderas and, um, and um, volcanic flows and uh, basically uh, frozen lava plains um, throughout the surface. So Venus is um, a pretty hellish uh, place um, to visit. Um, and uh, there's really no possibility of life. Although again, like Mars, um, we think um, there's evidence that Venus uh, probably had water very early on, but it lost it. Um, and it actually might have even had water as recently as a billion years ago. So um, Venus um, has changed pretty dramatically over the, um, the history of the solar system. And finally, our last planet is our home planet, planet Earth. And um, many of you are obviously um, pretty familiar with our home planet. And um, it's also known as the water planet because 70% of its surface is covered in oceans. And, um, and depending on which part you fly down to, uh, you might even look like 100% of the Earth is covered in oceans. Obviously, we're over in the Pacific right now. Um, but uh, there are a number of reasons why Earth um, was able to remain um, hab habitable um, over the, the lifetime of the solar system, even though um, you know, the different fates befell our planetary neighbors. And um, one reason is that Earth has a um, strong magnetic field, um, you know, and that's the same reason that you can use compasses um, to figure out uh, which direction is north. And that magnetic field helps uh, funnel away and redirect um, cosmic rays and solar uh, wind particles. Um, so it helps protect our atmosphere. Um, and the oxygen in our atmosphere, um, when um, it interacts with ultraviolet light from the sun, it forms um, a, a chemical called ozone. And even though ozone is a pollutant, um, it's hazardous to our health down here on the surface of the earth, when it's high up in the stratosphere, it actually protects um, us from um, some of the harmful ultraviolet radiation. And, um, and then finally, um, um, strange enough, 
the fact that um, you know one reason the Earth has a magnetic, or the reason why the Earth has a magnetic field, is that its um, outer core is still molten, and so those um, molten currents um, create the magnetic field. But uh, that internal heat also drives plate tectonics on the surface of the Earth. So the idea that the Earth's um, crust is broken up into a bunch of plates that move. And uh, it's thought that um, this motion of the plates and the cycle of carbon between the surface and the interior um, it acts sort of like a thermostat. It um, helps keep um, the, um, the surface of the um, Earth uh, warm and temperate, um, even though the sun was much dimmer in the past. And you know, in the past, we've had ice ages. Um, but we've recovered from those because of the fact that the Earth is a very dynamic uh, planet. And so with that, um, we're finished with the, uh, the main part of the presentation, but I'm happy uh, to take questions. And so memory, um, if there are any questions um, about um, habit habitability and life in our solar system and life elsewhere in the universe, I'm happy uh, to take them. Yes, and we have plenty of questions rolling in. Hi, everybody. It's me, Memory. I um, work here at the museum in the marketing department, and I am just going to read your questions to Kachuna. First off, I just wanted to show you my space shirt. Oh, wow, um, that looks great. So we have some, you know, <laughs> airship, planet, space, you know, just a little something I picked up, you know, and I said, this is perfect for our science division live today. Um, <laughs> so I'm in the mood. I, this is my uh, most favorite topic here at the museum, space. So let's get right on into it. We have plenty of questions. And I'll say I'm monitoring Facebook and YouTube. So um, if you're watching us on YouTube and you have any questions, drop them in the chat and I'll be sure to ask those as well. Um, so how about we just go and get started? Actually, first I'll read some of these um, awesome comments from, we have one from Michael who says, hi Kachoon, Astro rocks. Totally, completely agree. Vanessa says, hello, my kiddos are so excited to learn all about this. Thank you so much for joining us, Vanessa. All right, and our first question from Jim who asked, Earth clearly has active and moving cont continental masses. Are Mars and Venus tectonic in any way? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so it turns out that um, they don't um, appear um, to be to have the same um, sort of tectonic plates. So uh, when we look at um, um, Venus, for instance, um, you know, even though um, there is um, volcanic activity that um, suggests that you know the, the interior um, was um, hotter in the past, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, there's some debate about whether uh, people can detect uh, volcanoes on Venus today. Uh, it seems most volcanic activity is um, is pretty dormant. Uh, but there's some debate whether uh, people are seeing signs of emissions from volcanoes. But uh, Venus doesn't have um, any um, tectonic plates. And, um, and, and so it appears to be, um, so it doesn't have the same type of continental drift um, that um, we find um, on, um, on other worlds, uh, like, like, like the Earth. And um, let's see, I need to run something. Um, just a second here. Um, and um, um, and Mars is, is similar in the sense that um, you know, um, re researchers have looked for signs of um, plates on Mars, but uh, they don't really see um, any evidence that um, the same sort of plates that you find on the Earth or on Mars. Um, and But there is um, tectonic activity in the sense that the surface um, does have volcanoes. Um, and the surface is cracked. And so we um, are zoomed into um, Valles Marineris, which is a, um, a giant canyon on, on, on Mars. And um, um, it's, you know, if you think about how big the Grand Canyon is in the United States, well, the Valles Marineris is a, the gr um, grandest canyon in the solar system because it basically stretches, um, if you measured it from one to end, um, it would um, be the width of the United States. That's how big it is. But unlike the Grand Canyon on the Earth, which is curved by the Colorado River, um, this appears to be just a giant crack or break in the crust of Mars, where um, the, the surface is just um, cracked open and spread apart. And, um, and so there's still um, some mystery as to how this formed. Um, it might have to do with the fact that there are 
uh, volcanoes um, pretty close by on Mars um, in the Tharsis Plain. And um, so um, this part of the crust has um, kind of um, pushed open because the volcanoes have bulged the crust out. And, um, and then another interesting re um, effect of Mars not having uh, tectonic plates is that um, you, know, you might uh, remember that on, um, on the Earth, um, uh, the Hawaiian Islands um, were created um, as a result of um, plate movement, that there's a hot spot in our mantle of the Earth. And as the plate uh, moves, that hot spot creates um, different islands. So the most recent one, the largest um, one is the Hawaii, island of Hawaii. Um, but um, on Mars, because the, um, there isn't any plate movement, hotspots tend to stay in one place. And so the largest volcano in the solar system is Olympus Mons, which is right here. And it's a giant shield volcano, just like um, Hawaii um, in the Pacific Ocean on Earth, uh, but because the plates don't move, that hot spot has stayed in one place for a long time that has allowed this volcano to build up to be um, basically about the same size or slightly larger than the state of Colorado. That's how big um, this volcano is. Interesting. All right, hopping over to YouTube, we have a comment from Black Dog Blue who says, Hi, Katoon. Thanks for doing this presentation today. And thank you for watching with us, Black Dog Blue. Black Dog Blue also asks, Do you think life can exist on non dynamic planets or is this dynamism? Dynamism, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I probably ruined that word of a molten core, continental drift, et cetera, necessary. That's a really good question. You know, um, is what we see um, for the Earth necessary for life to exist elsewhere um, in the universe? And um, and right now um, we don't really know um, the answer. Um, you know, there there are actually um, lots of uh, possible uh, potential places for life, um, even within our solar system. Uh, just because um, one of the things we've discovered is that um, you know wherever um, we find water on the um, Earth we find um, evidence um, for life. And um, so we think water is a pretty key ingredient for life, but it also appears that water, even liquid water is pretty common even in our solar system. So even though Mars is very dry, uh, Venus is very dry, um, we think that um, some of the outer moons of the solar system like Europa um, has a icy shell of water um, that might be 30 miles, uh, 40 miles thick, but underneath, we think um, there's actually a subterranean um, subsurface ocean that might contain as much as um, two times the amount of um, water in all of the oceans on the earth. And uh, so we're definitely really interested in exploring uh, Europa as well as other uh, moons and uh, small planet, um, planetary bodies in our solar system, just because we're finding evidence that um, oceans can exist um, even um, on, um, in places that are much further from the sun. Um, so um, what is well outside of the traditional definition of a habitable zone. Um, and, but as far as you know, what it's like on other worlds um, outside of our solar system, I mean, we are finding uh, lots of Earth-like uh, planets and even some that are in the habitable zones, uh, their parent stars. Um, but you know, right now we only have one example of life in the entire universe. And there are some people uh, who've even written books um, talking about how, you know, life um, and especially complex or even intelligent life must be extremely rare in the universe just because if you look at all the conditions that make life possible on Earth. But I think, uh, yeah, that's a very dangerous um, argument to make just because um, I'm always humbled by how much um, scientists don't know about the universe. You know, whenever we've launched new satellites, or uh, build new telescopes that allow us to see further and more detail than before. We're always surprised by um, new, our new discoveries. And so um, I, I think, you know, there's a lot that we know, don't, don't know about um, what the conditions of life uh, might be elsewhere. And um, I, I, I'd be happy to be um, surprised about, um, you know, places um, that are so um, strange to us, but um, could still um, uh, you know, places that uh, could still have evolved life. And um, we'll just have to wait to see. 
and the questions are rolling in. We're gonna try to get to all of these before we close. Um, we have one question on Facebook from our very own curator of dinosaurs, um, Dr. Joe Sertich. I mean, in uh -huh. this question, it needs an answer. I mean, okay. I, okay, so he asked, how long could a Taurosaurus survive on the surface of Mars? Okay, um, it probably wouldn't survive for very long um, at all uh, because <laughs> Mars um, has um, an atmosphere that's about 1% the thickness, so 1% the dens density of the Earth. And, um, and so um, it, it would um, asphyxiate um, right away. So it, regardless um, whether you're a dinosaur or whether um, you're a human being, you know, any um, animal that requires um, um, air to breathe, and especially um, oxygen, um, you would not be able to, um, to survive on, on Mars. And then finally, Mars, um, most of its atmosphere, actually, I went to the wrong planet. Sorry about that. Let me fly to Mars. Um, uh, and um, even with a 1% atmosphere, um, at least 95% of that is carbon dioxide. There is um, almost no oxygen in the atmosphere of Mars. And um, and what oxygen there, um, there was in the atmosphere um, basically got locked up in the rocks and in the, um, the soil um, and formed iron oxide, and so, uh, which is rust. And so the same reason that it, uh, Mars looks red is because the oxygen bound with the rocks and with the dust on Mars um, to create its reddish color. Interesting. So Taurosaurus can survive at the museum, which we do have one currently at the museum, but not so much on Mars. No. It duly noted. <laughs> so Allison asks, hi there. I am curious as to how do you tell the difference between wind marks and water marks? This is so cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not a geologist and, um, and planetary scientists um, who study Mars. Um, those who study the surface of Mars actually have a, um, typically have a geology background, but if you talk to geologists, there are um, ways to tell the difference between um, features that are created by um, that are um, aeolian or um, created by wind um, blown processes versus features that um, were caused by um, running water, and um, and so if you look at um, river channels and river deltas and things on the surface of the earth, you can actually find a lot of um, the same and similar analogs on Mars where it looks like the surface has been sculpted by running water. Um, and, uh, but um, especially with um, really high resolution um, spacecraft imagery um, uh, based on um, from spacecraft that are in orbit around Mars, we also see a lot of windblown uh, features. So uh, if you notice that Mars has these darker uh, regions on the surface, and including um, in addition to the lighter uh, reddish, um, brown, orangish um, surface. Well, the, uh, the darker regions are actually um, just dark, uh, different um, types of dust, dark, darker dust that has been blown around the surface. And so those darker regions actually change. And uh, from super high resolution satellite imagery, we can also um, see evidence of dunes on Mars um, which um, can also change over time. And uh, from robots um, or robotic, robotic explorers on the surface, uh, they're, you know, they're taking pictures constantly of the surface and they also see signs of dust devils. So there are uh, definitely a lot of different um, you know, features that can be created um, by the wind um, as well as um, by running water. Awesome. And another question um, on YouTube from Matthew who asks, how hot is Mars? How hard is Mars? Um, well, it turns out that Mars, um, in, in some places during the summer, it can get um, warm enough that um, you know if you were an astronaut on the surface, um, you could potentially um, be outside in short sleeves. But then again, you wouldn't be able to breathe, and so you'd still need a spacesuit uh, to be on the surface. But uh, for the most part, you know, um, Antarctica is a really good analogy uh, for Mars as far as how cold it can get, and um, especially in the winter and on the nighttime. Um, side, uh, Mars um, can get brutally, brutally cold. Okay. Well, plenty of questions rolling in. We have a question from Jim on Facebook who, said, who says, can't recall the reference, but I was given to understand that the surface of Venus was completely replaced about a billion years ago. Is that so? How the heck could that happen? Could it happen on Earth? 
Yeah, that's um, that's um, actually um, correct in the sense that you know people um, really do think that um, Venus um, had its surface um, replaced, and what that meant um, is that um, you know um, remember what I said that Venus um, was completely covered in um, lava uh, flows that have solidified, and there's basically lots of lava uh, or vo volcanic features on the surface. Well, um, it turns out that um, instead of um, the, uh, the lava flowing over a period of time, it appeared that the, the entire surface um, was inundated by lava um, on the order of about um, half a billion years ago. And so, um, and, and, and that's just from um, using craters to date the surface. Um, we, um, we can count the number of craters and, um, and we can tell that you know, pretty much the entire surface has roughly the same age of about half a billion years. And um, it's a mystery as to why um, this happened, um, but um, the, the current, um, some of the current um, theories that I've seen have to do with the fact that Venus doesn't have plate tectonics, that um, it's basically just one giant um, plate. And so on the Earth, because there are um, multiple plates, you have lots of volcanic activity um, that are, uh, occur at the margins or at the edges of the plates. And so, um, you know, the Earth um, has um, a very hot interior and that hot material wants to get out. And the way that it gets out is um, through volcanoes. But on Venus, without um, any plate tectonics, there, um, and um, basically that hot material had a really hard, um, was very, it was very difficult for it to get, get out from underneath um, the surface and, until um, it reached this uh, breaking point and it basically um, un inundated the surface um, um, in, in a very um, short period of time and not just you know, at one spot, but um, all over um, the entire surface. And so the reason why uh, Venus might have um, undergone this um, resurfacing um, process um, might have had to do with the fact that um, it doesn't have plate tectonics. And, um, and, and so that's also why that um, it's unlikely um, the Earth would undergo such a, a huge process. But uh, for what I, uh, from what I understand from my geology friends, there have been periods um, in the Earth's past where there has been gigantic uh, volcanic eruptions uh, that have um, you know, laid down um, tens of miles worth of, um, or even uh, millions of cubic um, feet of uh, volcanic um, lava and other um, eruptive material. Um, they've occurred in India and they've occurred in Siberia. And so um, you know, that might be something that might happen again in, in the far future. Awesome. So how about we let, um, let's do two more questions. We have two really great questions left. Um, one on Facebook from Curtis who asks, what plant would be most reliable for terraforming? Ah, terraforming. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so terraforming, um, the idea behind terraforming, and we can go back to the earth, is to, um, to try and make a planet that um, is more Earth-like. So you know, starting off um, with a planet um, like Venus or Earth or, or, or Mars, and, um, and, and then um, convert it in, into um, a planet that is more habitable or more conducive to um, life um, here on Earth. And, uh, the, and the planet that um, people usually talk about terraforming is Mars. And that's just because uh, people um, think of Mars um, being the most um, Earth-like, even though, as we uh, have seen, it's, it's not very Earth-like. But uh, some of the idea, um, there are several things that you have to do um, to terraform Mars. One is to thicken its atmosphere um, so that um, it, um, with a thick enough atmosphere and with enough um, heat trapping gases like carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, um, you can warm up the surface. And uh, with a thicker atmosphere, you can also have um, liquid water that can exist on the surface. And, um, and without um, a thicker atmosphere, water would um, instantly evaporate. So if you poured a bottle of water out on the surface, it would go into the atmosphere, it wouldn't stay on the surface. And um, there are a number of ways that people um, have come up with thickening the atmosphere, and most of it involves um, trying to heat up um, what um, um, little um, water um, is on, uh, that, that, that's uh, buried deep uh, beneath the, uh, the soil in the form of ice. And, um, and so uh, people have come up with different schemes to heat up um, and to, um, to liberate um, that water. Um, 
And, and once you start doing that, um, you um, would have to uh, basically seed uh, the planet uh, with some kind of plant life so that you can start building up an, uh, an, an atmosphere with oxygen. And people um, talk about um, using uh, you know, microscopic um, plankton um, or bacteria uh, like um, life forms or uh, with lichen. Um, but um, you know, whatever um, you uh, see the, the surface of Mars with, you would probably have to genetically engineer because um, they would have to be really hardy to survive the conditions on Mars uh, that um, currently exist. And to um, sort of give you an idea of how long this would take, uh, people who've done the preliminary calculations on terraforming Mars estimate that the second uh, process of building up, um, well, um, I mean, the whole process of thickening the atmosphere and then uh, building up the oxygen levels could take on the order of about 100,000 years. So we're very far from having a planet B to live on without a spacesuit. Wow. wow. How about we let this be our final question before we end. Um, from Carlos, who asks, who says, hi, memory. Will we ever expect life on Mars? If so, when? OK, well, um, there um, is a possibility that life um, once existed on Mars, because as we said, Mars was warmer and wetter in the past. And so if you imagine, you know, uh, Mars had oceans uh, for, uh, you know, perhaps a billion years, people don't uh, quite know, uh, there would have been opportunities for life, perhaps microscopic life to have um, established on the surface of Mars. And then as Mars got colder and it dried out, you know, perhaps that life um, evolved to survive underground where um, there might be places that are warm enough for um, liquid water to be trapped underneath the surface. And so you might have microbial life on the surface. And so that um, does excite a lot of scientists. And that's why um, you know, the, um, the current um, spacecraft that is landing on Mars, uh, Perseverance, uh, it's landing tomorrow. And I think we have a museum event uh, that will uh, showcase that landing. So definitely tune into that if you have a chance tomorrow. Um, starting in the late morning and into the afternoon. Um, one of its um, chief um, missions is to look for evidence of um, either fossilized life um, or perhaps even, you know, there might be evidence of um, ongoing life um, on or close to the surface right now. But uh, right now we don't see any signs of macroscopic life. So life that's big enough um, to really show up um, from our cameras on the surface or from orbit. So there are obviously no forests on Mars, um, but uh, there might be microscopic life. And then in the future, if we land uh, human astronauts on Mars, that will probably be the first uh, macroscopic life on Mars um, will be the kind that come from Earth. Awesome, and I love that you just dropped our events tomorrow. I just dropped the link to the Facebook event in our chat. Um, I'm going to drop that on YouTube as well so that you can go and register if you'd like to join us. Sarah also in our comments brought that up and I was going to say something and I love that you brought that up too. Thanks for watching, Sarah. She's always watching with us. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll be right back here tomorrow to watch Perseverance Lynn on Mars. But until then, thank you so much for joining us today. Any last yeah. words for us, Kachu? No, yeah, but uh, yeah, thanks everyone for your great questions. I mean, um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of um, deep thinkers out there about life in the universe. So I love the questions. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll be here again with Science Division Live next week here and on YouTube. We'll see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye.